Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here with you again this morning. Anybody excited about Valentine's Day? Ooh, we have some guys that must be in the doghouse. Ouch. Now, we all know it's about the wives and the girlfriends, right? It's not about us men. So, guys, I don't know if you've done anything yet, but you've got about 12 hours or so, so get on it. But uh, this time, this is just falls great with what we're talking about today, because at Valentine's Day, it gives us guys a chance to serve our ladies. Now, I know we associate chocolate and flowers and a bunch of pink stuff and sometimes diamonds and stuff with this holiday, but, you know, if we really want to show them that we care about them, how about doing the dishes? How about doing the laundry and folding it? How about just taking the kids so mama can have a break? Can I get an amen, somebody? All right, ladies. No. But uh, we sh- need to be showing our wives that we love them, not just by the stuff we buy for them, but how we live it out with our action. We need to serve them, not because we're expecting anything in return, but because we genuinely care about them. Now, this has uh, been an issue for me and my wife a few times. We are nowhere close to being perfect, obviously. And uh, this kind of came to a head a few months for us when it came to certain household chores. And uh, if you've been around Vi for a while and you've ever heard me preach, but about every other time I talk about the dishes, it's a big deal in my household. And it so happened a couple months ago, a friend of ours who's a uh, counselor came to me and Maggie and said, hey, I've got this new program I'm going to be trying out with couples and all that. Would you guys be a guinea pig couple? I just need you to take a test, and we talk about it for a little bit. And, and I just want to get used to what I'm doing before I start using it for real. So we're like, sure, why not? So we go into her office, and she's talking through the test results and everything. And, you know, we we're, think we're doing pretty good and everything. And I don't know how she did it. I, I really don't. But all of a sudden, we're on some topics that's creating some heat and some friction. And it all boiled down to one thing, the dishes. And so we're going back. I wasn't joking about the dishes being a big deal. I was totally serious. But we're, we're going back and forth, and she's like, but you never do the dishes. And I'm like, I did them yesterday. What are you talking about? Well, you don't notice. I always have to tell you to do them. Well, what do you want me to do, woman? I'll do them. Just ask me. And we're just going back and forth, going back and forth. And it was starting to get heated. And uh, the counselor lady is like, okay, hey, hey, guys. How much is your marriage worth to you? And we're like, a lot. She's like, is it worth 10 bucks a month? And we're like, well, actually, yes, it is. How can I sign up? What's $10 a month? And she's like, use paper plates. <laughs> yeah, that's simple. But anyway, paper plates and a dishwasher have helped us out a lot in the last couple months. But the big point is, I could show my wife that I love her. I can show her how much I care for her, not just by saying nice things to her, not just by remembering Valentine's Day and anniversaries, but by actually serving her, taking a little bit of load off of her plate, taking the initiative to do something. And I don't know about you guys, but that's hard for me to take initiative to do this stuff because one, I just don't notice. So learning, training myself to actually notice things is a challenge. But I want to show my wife each and every day that I really care about her and that I love her. I fail often, but I'm still getting better. I'm still going to keep working at it. And you know, that's one of the best ways, not just in our marriages, but overall, if we care about something, we do something about it, right? If you care about your car, you're not going to let your car languish without a car wash for months on end, or garbage pile up in the seats, are you? No, you care about it. You're going to do something about it. We serve others We serve and do things because we care about things. Anybody ever had a bad boss that sat behind a desk and just barked orders? Yeah, not our favorite type of boss. I've had a couple of those before, and no, I'm not talking about Pastor Randy. But one time I was working at a McDonald's and had two different managers. One manager was always right by us. But the whole crew, he's working with us. He's helping us do orders. He's coaching us. Sometimes he's yelling at us. It didn't matter. But he was right there with us, working alongside us. We had another manager who, let's just say, didn't have the same work ethic. She would go back to the office and then only come out of it to bark orders. And nobody respected her. 
everybody respected the guy because he was right in the middle of it. He was serving alongside of us. We tend to respond better. We understand that somebody actually cares about us when they do something about it as well. You know, when uh, we have kids, we work tirelessly to take care of them, don't we? We're changing their diapers when they're younger. We're putting up with all kinds of stuff when the school calls us later on in life. But we are continually working and working and working to take care of our children because we care for them. And we hope one day that maybe they're going to take care of us. Maybe. Jury's out. You know, we want to show care. We want to serve others when we care about them. And when we want to get the service, we usually go pay for it, right? We go to the spa. We go to the restaurant. You know, and if we receive good service, we might even throw on a tip. You know, as a side note, did you guys know that, that Sunday is one of the worst days for waiters and waitresses? Because of church people. I'm serious. I hear some nervous chuckles, but I'm dead serious. Christians are the worst tippers. Isn't that a shame? So when you go out to eat this afternoon, tip your waiter and waitress. Good. Let's change that stereotype. Let's uh, serve them back in return. But anyway, here's where we're getting at. All right? Last week, we talked about how much God cares about lost people. How he's willing to do anything to be able to reach somebody so that they can find that love that only comes from Jesus, so they can have that relationship restored with God. Now, Jesus said that over and over again on his time on earth, that he came to seek and to save the lost. Now, Jesus didn't just say that he came to seek and to save the lost. He did something about it. And we looked at examples of that last week, how Jesus is willing to go against the cultural, the cultural norms to reach somebody. We looked at how uh, Jesus was willing to spend time and invest in people. We looked at all these examples. But you know what else Jesus taught us? He taught us to serve one another in love. And again, this wasn't just something that Jesus decided to teach about, teach about something. This was something that Jesus showed us how to do it. Everywhere he went, with everybody he came in contact, he was constantly serving people. Constantly. In fact, if you look at the four Gospels, the, the four books in the Bible that recall the life and teaching of Jesus, you'll notice there was one question that Jesus asked more than any other, and that was, what can I do for you? Jesus came with an attitude and a mentality to serve. Now, you've got to understand how big this is. Here's Jesus, who was God himself in man's form, had all authority. He could have just told the angels what to do, could have just snapped his fingers and is taken care of, but he chose to come and serve. Now that's huge. Here's God himself serving people. He didn't just say it, he lived it. He showed us an example. What can I do for you is what he asked. You know, the whole, I don't know if any of you guys in your profession have heard about the servant leader model. That's where we get it, is from Jesus how he came and he served. And the way he served, the way he came 2,000 years ago, look at us today, all over the world, people's lives are still being changed by this model that Jesus left us. And as we grow in our relationship with Christ, you know, as we engage in serving, God uses that to change our hearts, to make us more like him. God cares about people. And when we serve others, we're reflecting that same love. We're placing value on people as well. And God uses that to form our hearts, to make us more into his likeness. And uh, in fact, we're marked by this. In John 13, 35, Jesus tells us, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Could somebody tell that you're a follower of Jesus by the way you treat others? by the way you treat your church family, your own family, we're, in fact, marked by this love, by how we serve others. I don't think you can be a Christ follower if you're not willing to step out and show love. I have serious problems with people who go and protest funerals and all these other things that aren't showing love. They're showing hate. I've got a problem with that. I'm sorry. I don't see them out serving the homeless. I don't see them out serving one another in their church. We need to be known and marked by our love 
for one another. Jesus talked a lot about this, and I love this story we're about to dive into where it really cuts right to the core of the matter because it doesn't matter who the person is, but God gives you an opportunity always to serve somebody in love. So check this out. Luke 10, 25 to 37. We're going to read the story and then break it down a little bit. All right. On one occasion, Jesus, or uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Let's take a closer look here. So you see this story opens up where Jesus is talking to this group of people. And so this expert in the law tries to, to question him. All right, an expert in the law back then, that's not just like a lawyer in our common day. These were expert in the religious laws. So they knew all like front and back and do I do this? Do I do that? It's all this religious law in the, in the, the Jewish culture of the day. So there's a good chance that Jesus is talking to also a bunch of other religious leaders at this time. Now, if you, if you know the, the history between Jesus and the religious leaders, you know that they weren't exactly his biggest fans. And uh, so you see a time in and time again where they're always trying to trip Jesus up, trying to catch him on something. And that's what was happening here. This, this legal expert, this expert of the law, is just looking for that gotcha moment with Jesus. Looking to trip him up. So he asked this one question, which Jesus turned it around very beautifully and, and got a good answer. So the guy's probably a little indignant, and he's looking for another chance to trip Jesus up. That's why he asked. Well, who's my neighbor? And he's just looking for that got you and looking for any little detail to finally nab Jesus. He wasn't expecting this story that Jesus answered back with. <clears throat> it was very, very unexpected. And I think it was something that humbled him as well. And we're going to look at why that would have been in a moment. But Jesus is the story that he told. We don't know if it was a true story or just a parable or something that he that Jesus would use to help us understand truth, but it was powerful, and it made a clear point to those who he was talking to. First, you've got this man who's traveling down from Jerusalem to Jericho. This would have been a really windy kind of mountainous path as, as they descended toward that city of Jericho. This road was known for having a lot of robbers and thieves just because of the landscape of it. So this guy's going down there. He gets mugged. All right, beaten, all of his things taken from him, and quite frankly, left for dead. Now, notice the first person that Jesus uses as an example in this story is a priest. Now, if, if your pastor comes by you on the side of the road, and you're there, left for dead, wouldn't you expect them to stop and help you? Okay, they don't have a lot of confidence. Great. Um, I would stop and help you, just so you know, I would. <laughs> but you would expect this great religious leader, a priest, to stop and help the guy, right? That's kind of what you're in the business of doing, bud. You're helping people. 
All right, but he doesn't. He not only ignores the fact that this guy is there needing help, but he chooses to avoid the fact. He steps to the other side of the road. Okay? He didn't stop for the dude and pray for him. He didn't say, hey, man, hope thing, your day turns out better later. He avoids them. Then it happens again by a Levite. Now, this would have been somebody that was higher class, somebody you would expect to be respectable, someone who would jump in and take leadership. But the same thing happens again. They ignore and avoid. Ignore and avoid this poor guy. Third person that comes along. As soon as Jesus said the word Samaritan, I guarantee you they weren't thinking that this is a dude that's going to save them. They're thinking, this dude's toast. This guy's just going to kick him down the cliff. He's going to ignore him again. This guy's a goner. The Jews and Samaritans had a very, very bad relationship. They had a lot of animosity toward one another. So the fact that Jesus would bring up a Samaritan, it wouldn't even cross their minds that this is the guy who would help. But yet we see in the story, the Samaritan, the guy who you would never guess, is the one who gets off his horse, gets off his donkey, goes to the guy, takes care of him, even takes him to an inn, and pays for additional care. This was the neighbor. This is something that those religious leaders, those experts in the law, didn't want to hear. They were thinking... Neighbor. Yeah, that's my next door neighbor. If I don't like Bob, I'm just going to move. All right? That's how they lived. It was convenient. Yeah, I'm going to show my neighbor love until I don't like him anymore. Or maybe maybe some of them had a broader broader understanding of neighbor. Maybe they thought just those in their culture, those other Jews. Yeah, I'll help them because of this and that. Yeah, I've got to show love to other Jews. And here Jesus comes along with this answer that shatters that absolutely shatters that perception of who my neighbor is. And they know he's right. They understand that he's right through this story. And it humbled them. Now note that the expert in the law, when he said, when he replied to Jesus' answer, and who was the neighbor, he didn't say the Samaritan. Lewis brought this up to me in between services, that he wouldn't even say the name Samaritan. humbled him. It caught him off guard. Jesus, or the, the teacher immediately understood what Jesus was getting at. That to follow God and to love God, you've got to love people. It doesn't matter what their circumstance is. It doesn't matter what their culture is. It doesn't matter what their statute, stature in the community is. We've got to love people. To love God, we've got to to love people. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of hot air and religion. To love God, we've got to love people. If you say you love God, I want to see how you treat others. Because that is only validated by how you treat people here on earth. So what does that got to do with you? Now, is anybody traveling that road tomorrow between Jerusalem and Jericho? Maybe find somebody mugged? I, I doubt it. You know, if you are, that is awesome. Um, but most of us, <coughs> excuse me, aren't going to find some dude mugged in the alley tomorrow. That's not what Jesus is getting out, is helping the poor guys who are mugged. It's something much, much broader at that. It's what Jesus said. If we want to follow him, if we want to be great in his kingdom, we've got to become the servant of all. Not the servant of those who we like. Not the servant of those who it's convenient for us to serve. We've got to become the servant of all. If you want to grow in your relationship with God, if you want to give him a chance to work in your heart, start serving. Start serving others. Go find an opportunity to serve. I don't think that's an option for us as followers of Jesus. We've got to serve. We have a responsibility as we follow Christ to serve others in love. God uses that to form us spiritually. Now, how many of you guys... Okay, you don't have to raise your hand. Have a trouble with pride sometimes. I'll be the first one to admit it. Maggie would love to tell you about my problem with pride sometimes. Absolutely, she, she loves to smear me like that. But 
serving people, placing value on people, helps me to keep that in check and helps it allows me to open up my heart for God to work on that with me. When I'm serving around others, it helps them to build me up spiritually and to continue to learn and to grow in what God has for me. So I want to encourage you guys, don't just sit back and leave this spiritual formation on the table. Take hold of it. And I want to look at three things. And I'm going to challenge each of you guys at the end of the, of the day to get involved. But as you do that, let's look at three things that we can learn as well from this story of what it takes to really serve somebody out of love. First of all, you've got to have consciousness or awareness of a situation. Looking back at the story of the three people, every single one of them was aware of the circumstance. The priest saw the guy, but he crossed the other side. The Levite saw the guy. He was aware of the problem, but he crossed to the other side. The Samaritan saw the guy, but he did something about it. But the first step is being aware. There are opportunities all around us, each and every day, that we have to show somebody love, to serve somebody. Small things and big things. When I talk about serving, don't get this big embellished picture in your head. The little things matter more than you could ever imagine. How God could take something so small as paying for somebody's order on the drive through behind you. Something so small and use it to change somebody's life. Something so small as to greet somebody at the door and shake their hand on Sunday morning. God can use that thing that may be small in our minds to do something big. But it first starts with awareness. We have to see and be conscious of the opportunities to serve others that are all around us. I know sometimes we don't want to be conscious of it. Because being conscious of it could mean that we have a responsibility to act. One of the worst things that's going on in our culture, in our world today, is human trafficking, modern-day slavery. Knowing about that gives us a responsibility to act. And I know that I didn't want to know. I do know, but I didn't want to because of the heavy responsibility that comes with knowing. But be aware of the opportunities that you have, big and small, to show somebody that kind of love. You know, if we're in it for the wrong reasons, we want people to, to just look at us, like, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, that's not the kind of awareness I'm talking about, looking for opportunities for you to be lifted up. Look for opportunities where you can help somebody so God can help you work on your pride, so God can spiritually form you into who he's called you to be. Next, it's going to take contact. It's going to take involvement. All right? Note that the Samaritan guy, he didn't run to the next town and tell somebody there's a guy that needs help. He didn't pass by and say, brother, bless you. I'm praying for you. And here's a dollar. Hope your day turns out better. He didn't do that. He got involved. He got in the game. After you see an opportunity, you got to act. Otherwise, you're just a kind-hearted person, and God bless you, but you got to act. If this Samaritan hadn't have acted, it's a very good chance that this guy would have died. Our, as we serve others, there is no serving without acting on it. You see the opportunity, and then you seize the opportunity. To serve somebody. The, guy, the Samaritan, yes, he got dirty. Yes, he got bloody. But he made a difference in that person's life. He came into contact with that person. Serving isn't something we do from the sidelines. It's not something we do from the stands. It's something we do on the field, in the game. Can it get messy? Absolutely, it can get messy. Can it be inconvenient? Absolutely. That Samaritan had people to see, things to do, places to go. But he jumped in, he got involved. When you step into serving, when you put somebody else above your own needs, above your own desires, God's going to use you to make a difference in that person's life. And God's going to use those situations to grow you and to form you into who he wants you to be. Thirdly, it's going to cost something. Now, this is the least pleasant of all of them, I know. The Samaritan, look at what it cost him. 
He had to use his resources, his wine and his oil and his bandages as he tended to the guy. His donkey, even his money, when he put him up in the inn, when he offered to pay the additional cost, it cost him his resources to help this guy. I think for us, one of the biggest barriers that we have when it comes to cost isn't a money issue, it's a time issue. I hear this time and time again. That Pastor Chuck, I just don't have the time. I never said it was going to be easy or convenient. But the cost sometimes is our time. And that's a precious commodity. But what can God do through you with your time? Ask yourself that. What can God do through you if you're willing to invest in that time that it takes to serve somebody? Maybe it'll involve a physical cost like in this story, but maybe not. But it'll take a cost. But you know what What I've seen, though? Often, the higher the cost, the more God does through you and in you. If you're willing to, to invest, God's going to show up and do something. We can make a difference when we see the problem, when we do something about the problem, and when we invest. The, the guy in our story, his life was saved because the Good Samaritan did all three of these things. He saw it, he did something, and he paid up. His life was saved. You hear it by, we're on a mission to bring people to life. We as a church family, that is what we're all about, is bringing people to Jesus. It doesn't mean that we're looking for mug victims again every day. That's not the point of the story. That we all have a part that we can play in this mission to bring people to Jesus. But we've got to be aware of the opportunities that we have. And we've got to be willing to put skin in the game. We often use the analogy of a cruise ship and a fishing vessel. The big difference is, many of you have already heard this, but the big difference is in a cruise ship, most people on the boat are just taken care of. They're nothing but consumers. On a fishing boat, everybody has a job and they get a lot of work done. When we serve together, we're making a difference in our church family, we're making a difference in our community, and we're making a difference in our world because we're bringing people to Jesus. I want to challenge everybody to get involved, to serve one another out of love. Let's start small, okay? Some of you are already doing a lot. I want to challenge you to take it to the next level. But for everybody, I want to challenge you to do something small starting today. I want to invite you to opportunities that we have here at Vibe where we can serve together and bring people to life. We, you know, every Sunday morning, we have five different ministry areas that are operating here. We have our worship team. We have our production team. We have our We Vibe, that's our birth to preschool. We have our basic element, that's our elementary age. And then we have our hospitality people. All of them work together, 11 different teams in all within those areas, work together to create amazing experience so that people can encounter Jesus. Start there. Start serving in the body with the body for this mission of bringing people to life. After service, all of our directors are going to be out by the info table. And uh, they're going to they're, uh, want to get you information about how to get involved. They'll take your contact information, get with you during the week so that you can get involved. Serving is so important that we actively engage this in our lives. Don't be a bystander. Don't just stay in the stand. I want to invite you to join us in this mission to bring people to life here at Vive. God's going to do something great in you. If, if you struggle with pride, if you struggle with insecurity, God can use and will use being involved to work in your heart, to work in your life. I'm going to ask the band to come back up as we start to close out. But I want you to think about right now, where are you when it comes to serving others? You need to remember, it's not about you. It's about them. It's not about me. It's about others. To put others first. That's a tough thing. Our culture tells us not to do that. Our culture tells us that it's all about us. But it's really about others. If you love God, you love others. It's that simple. 
I want to challenge you, be marked. Be known for the love that you have for others. Be known for how you show that love to others. Get involved. Get skin in the game. Be willing to get messy. God is going to use that again to help form you and make you into the person he's called you to be. This whole series, we've looked at how God uses different aspects to form us, to make us more into his likeness. This one, I think we see the tangible benefits a little easier than some of the areas. I've, see, I've watched people from not being involved in serving at all to just one step to step in, how God just starts to change them like that. Activate this area in your life. Would you guys stand with me? Serving one another is out of love. Be you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you're in here this morning and you've never taken that step to enter into a relationship with Jesus, and this morning I was mainly talking to Christ followers, but maybe you're in here and you haven't made that choice yet, this love that I'm talking about, that we're supposed to show others, this crazy love that God has for us, he has that love for you. He wants you to come home this morning. He wants you to come into a relationship with him. I want to encourage you to take that step and say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Jesus. Let his love start to transform your life. Let it start to transform your mind. Let it start to transform your heart this morning. It's as simple as just saying yes, Lord. Coming into my life. Forgive me. I love sitting there waiting for you. If that's you this morning, I'm not going to have you do anything weird or come up to the front. I just want to pray with you and agree with you this morning. Would you just raise your hand and you can put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. You can put it right back down. Anyone else? Amen. Thank you. I see your hand. You can put it right back down. For those of you who just raised your hand, we're going to pray together. If you just pray along in your own heart, Jesus is going to come in your heart and begin a new relationship with you right now. And after we're done praying to get together, I'm going to pray for our whole church family that as we engage in serving, that God would use that to affect other people's lives and also form us more in his likeness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning that you've given us, God. So we thank you that your love is new. We thank you that your love is real. We, we thank you, God, for your love and mercy that you just shower upon us. And Lord, right now, we just, we just come to you, Lord, those of us who raised our hands, and we ask that you would come into our heart, that you would come into our lives, that you would forgive us of our sins, that we could step into a brand new relationship with you. We ask that this would be the start of something great, that you would mold us and shape us into the people that you have called us to be. We thank you, Lord, for that transforming power and that forgiveness that we're experiencing right now. Thank you, Father. And Lord, we pray over our whole church family. God, as we go from here this morning, Lord, as we take those steps to get involved, God, as we look for those opportunities that you've placed in our life, God, I ask that you would help us to say no to the things that would hold us back. Lord, that we'd say no to being selfish, that we'd say no to, I don't have enough time, but that we'd say yes to showing love, that we'd say yes to people, that we'd say yes to reflecting the work that you've done in our hearts and lives. God, would you form us in your likeness? God, help us to humble ourselves before you, and Lord, not have a spirit of pride, but humility. And God, help us to love these people like you love them. Help us to love each other you love us. God, may we be known and marked by this love. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And I have this hope.
Listen, if you prayed that prayer and you said, you know what, I want to, I want to follow Jesus, 
there's a card in the chair in front of you looks just like this and it says get started would you fill that out and I'm gonna be in the lobby Chuck will be in the lobby there'll be some people with green I serve shirts would you give that to us we want to help you grow in your relationship with the Lord really that's what this whole series has been about the last five weeks is about growing spiritually I don't think spiritual growth is some mystical puzzle that God just you know kind of like he plays a trick on us I hope you figure it out you know he wants us to grow he wants us to know what the next step is and how do we do this I think the problem is not that he doesn't reveal to us how to grow spiritually I think the problem is we get comfortable with certain aspects you know we want to do the things that are comfortable to us right we want to do the things that that fit where we're at right now but there are things in our lives that we we need to engage you know, and we've been talking about belonging and believing and giving and reaching and serving and all of those, those things are, are disciplines or elements or, or gears that kind of need to be turning in our life. And some of those we're uncomfortable with, some of them we're comfortable with, but, but it's all of them moving at some, some pace that moves us forward and causes us to grow spiritually. And so I would encourage you to really, to just do a soul searching and just say, God, what is it? What's that area that I need to engage in my life and step into that? If you, and if you fill this card out, give it to us in the lobby. We'll be out there in just a little bit. And uh, also, that card that was on the chair, Toxic, would you take that and invite somebody to service next week and maybe even the weeks after and bring somebody to life? Can you do that? Father, thank you for a great day. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you, God, for grace in our lives, for forgiveness, for the life that we experience through you and we're truly alive. You said, Jesus, that you came that we might live life and live it to the fullest. God, help us to live out that full life, that complete life. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week and bring someone to life.